dimensional, transforming, musical, linguistic objects. Hey, I'm letting some more people come in. We've got a bunch of people here tonight, so I'm doing administrative things. Good to see you. Let me uh, get this thing going. Boy, we got a lot of people here early. This is great. This is the best crowd we've ever had here. <laughs> there, we got everybody that's coming for a while. Anyhow, good to see you all. Glad you're here. And, uh, oh, there's Sun. Okay, good. There's Al. Hey, Al. <laughs> and... Something that I do, if you guys want to, you can uh, right-click or control-click on your name and put where you're coming from. And that, that always helps. Antoine already did. And uh, Mark over in Georgia. Uh, son, I'm not – or <laughs> it says son, but it's Alan. <laughs> and – Oh, let me unmute. I'm going to unmute everybody's mic, but if you've got background noise and all, you can kind of mute your mic yourself. So uh, uh, that will keep that it that bothering us all. And what I do, if you want to, you can go to the upper right-hand corner of your screen, and you can go to – it has speaker view and gallery view, and it defaults into gallery view. But if you go to speaker view, you can see everybody at once, and I think that's nicer. So, speaker view because I don't have a flying around or something. <laughs> yeah, what is going on? With that? Well, to tell you the truth, I'm not quite sure what controls you have because I think I probably have different ones. It doesn't look like I'm flying around. Really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A few people on boy. You got a lot of people, dude. My goodness. Yeah, no, now, so. now sometimes some of y'all, if, if there's background noise or something, then you'll uh, be uh, clicking into video. I'll mute your audio, and you can always unmute it. Uh, and that way it will keep keep everybody's sound from uh, bleeding over. And I see uh, Bruce Damer in the background there with Al. So, hey, good to see you, Bruce. <laughs> hey, where are you guys? We're in, this, in Aptos, California, uh, by the ocean. Really? Uh, at, our, at our family beach house. Oh, see, I pictured you up in the top of the mountain in your regular place. Now we're down by these big waves right now, huge waves just outside the window here. It's uh, turbulent. You know, yesterday uh, we walked down the, by the beach in Carlsbad, and there were some, you know, eight to ten foot waves that the surfers were up right now. You could tell by, you know, they're twice as high as the surfers. A pretty amazing storm coming in. Oh, it is, truly. Oops. <laughs> it's okay, Scott. It's so, uh, definitely really fun out there. We'll take you out later. Oh, have have you been out surfing today, Al? Uh, no, I just got I just got here. I was up in Boulder Creek until a few minutes ago. So, yeah. how, how close are you guys to Boulder Creek? Oh, about forty five minutes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mountains to the ocean. We got the California lifestyle going here. You know, I, I I didn't know anything was within 45 minutes of Boulder Creek. It seemed like it always took me forever to get there. <laughs> well, you know, you don't want to go at rush hour. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not, you know, by the ocean here. You really you really get a sense of, of uh, you know, how vast this planet is. Seen and you get all that, that fresh air coming in from the, the off the ocean, thousands of miles of waves breaking that energy on the beach, you know. Yeah. Yeah, Japan's out there at the other end of it. Yeah, yeah Hawaii somewhere in the middle. Exciting to, so where are you, down in San Diego? Yeah, I'm, I'm still in San Diego right now. And, uh, oh, and actually... arriving momentarily. Actually, uh, the founder of Cal IT and Seagraph uh, um, um, and uh, John Graham from Does Burning Man Television. He, he's, he's arriving. He started Burning Man TV back in 95. And... Uh, and uh, yeah, they'll be here any minute. They're working on a project in San Francisco where they're growing mini brains from stem cells, human brains. Wow! And then connecting them directly with computers, you know, to look at the interface through electrolytic solutions. 
for for the the guys who are 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 new here and aren't familiar with John Graham, that I, I John John I know John. I visited with him a few times uh, at his uh, computer center here in town, and then uh, at yeah. Burning Man. But John's the one that started the live uh, video feed from Burning Man. That's right. That's yeah. right. And uh, he he uh, he pioneered that whole thing. You know, when, <laughs> when there wasn't even a cell phone signal out there, he was uh, sending live video. And I I think his last year was the year he had a uh, two cameras. He had one on a art cart moving around too. That's I right. That's right. We I was part of that uh, that cart thing. We'd go out to the, the big party out on the playa and uh, send a live signal back to the uh, station. And and uh, we had a lot of fun with that. That was really that was really great. And but I Burning Man much better than just the security cam. Yeah, what what I thought was really really uh, cool about that uh, art car video is you guys were able to uh, blur out the faces of people in the crowd. You know, you guys really uh, were the Burning Man vibe there. <laughs> yeah, it's the key to blur the faces. <laughs> it's funny how people don't want to be associated with having a great time. Y yeah. Every season still amazes me. Yeah, you know, they, they don't want their picture taken, then they go home and brag about being a Burning Man. What's that all about? <laughs> yeah, I know. Eh? What's, the, what's the reward system of this culture based on? Jeez. <laughs> so, so for, for you you and, uh, and uh, Bruce there, uh, a couple of our regulars are here, and uh, the, the one I want to kind of point out is, is Kevin. Kevin's on the road. He he calls in every every Monday night. He's in the middle of the country driving right now. <laughs> hey, Kevin, good to see you. All right. <laughs> so uh, and and Charles in Portland uh, and and uh, Courtney and uh, we've got a whole bunch of regulars here. Oh, here's Larry Martyr. Uh, Al, you you may recognize Larry's name uh, if you ever followed comics in Bean World. He's the creator of Bean World. Bean World. Yeah. Cool. Um, I guess <laughs> I'm. That's uh, the we have Gabby's coming over shortly. She's a reg, she's started a psychedelic salon in New Jersey, and she probably knows about that. Uh, we'll, we'll we'll bring her in when she arrives. Yeah. Any anybody's a comic book fan would would know about that. You know, he he's uh, Larry's been around. Uh, he looks like he's been around longer than me, don't you, Larry? But <laughs> I think I'm <laughs> zippy. I, I used to date Zippy the Pinhead's sister. <laughs> actually, I think it was uh, yeah, Bill Griffith, the guy who wrote Zippy, his, his sister. I lived with her for a year. She was, was she a, uh, huh? Was she a Pinhead too? She, no, she was really cool. She was really, but Bill Griffith wrote the underground comics in San Francisco. And, uh, as you know, Mr. Natural was uh, big back then too. But th that's my uh, connection with that world was the, the San Francisco. Also the, Fabulous furry phone freaks. That's where it all started. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Based on uh, John Draper stuff. Yeah, the uh, Captain the Captain Crunch. Um, he uh, we just oh, had him on. Uh, you know Captain Crunch? The phone guy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, John. Yeah. Yeah. He's in Las Vegas. I don't know him, but I remember him. <laughs> well, that's important. Yeah, he's 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 one of the original hackers of our of our society, you know. Back in the um, before there was even computer networks, when it was just a phone network, and that that was that were the wild that were the wild seas of uh, networking was the phone networks back in the uh, '60s and '70s. Yeah, the pay phones. You could you could uh, you could you could uh, hack those pay phones pretty easily. And back in in uh, I guess probably 20 years ago now, I, when I was uh, working for Verizon, I'm out. Yeah out giving a, a talk at a conference and it was somewhere out here in the west west area maybe arizona or something and this guy comes up to me and it was draper <laughs> really <laughs> oh yeah and i was supposed to hang around and and talk with people afterwards and all the two of us went to a bar and i just <laughs> bailed on the whole conference <laughs> he was a great guy to talk to <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. yeah, he's in Las Vegas now. He's working on some interesting new projects. <laughs> let, let, let me introduce you, Al. I, I told everybody that Bruce is going to be here, and they can see Bruce in the background there. Hey, Bruce, good to see you. And and uh, Bruce and I have, have this mutual friend. That, actually, Bruce introduced me to him. And uh, Al has one of the most amazing histories that you can imagine. And uh, if it wasn't for a publication he was involved with, I wouldn't be here right now. <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, Mondo 2000. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that, Al? Well, Mondo was a, kind of a, a counterculture magazine from the 90s in San Francisco. And uh, it covered a lot of the, the, um, the, the scene, the, the whole San Francisco scene that was unfolding. The cyberpunk, the cyber culture being part of that, uh, and the fashions of the time and the music. The whole uh, rave scene was just beginning. Um, and uh, the magazine was, was sort of in the middle of that, that, that whole thing. And, and uh, I was the tech editor. I was doing a lot of the articles that involved uh, the, you know, the freedom through technology, the, the, the personal computers, the, the CD-ROM, the interactive movies, uh, the idea that, uh, that uh, this technology will change everything and how it will do that. Uh, we, we had crazy articles like uh, ATMs and the rise of the hacker leisure yeah, class. Yeah, <laughs> stuff <Most> like that. <laughs> yeah, so we had a lot of fun on, uh, on seeing how this technology will really liberate us uh, rather than enslave us, which was the fear of the time. Yeah. How have we done? Uh, <laughs> we're still pretty much ruled by fear, from what I can see, sadly. Uh, except those that have free, you know, have freed themselves, and and they tend to hang out with others of their ilk, and that's good. I think I think we we could uh, have a true renaissance at this point. That's uh, that will make the Middle Ages look like child's play. I, th I still think it's possible. I think there are enough brilliant people alive to get it today, and uh, enough information at our fingertips to be able to really get creative and do some amazing things. And it's really a matter of our attitude. Uh, and I try to culminate with that. I have a radio show where I talk about this every week and, and to the public. Uh, it's a, it's a, um, a talk radio show on KSCO here in Santa Cruz. Uh, I play this character named Dr. Future. And, and uh, my wife, Mrs. Future, and I look at the uh, stories that are happening this week. And, uh, you know, like, like you see from CES, the Alexa phenomena mm -hmm. and how there's dozens of new devices that have AI built into them. Is this good or bad? I know. Are we, what should we use them to say? AIs for? Uh, uh, are they our friends? Um, you know, um, it's an unfolding story, and we try to go in the direction of where it actually can evolve us and enhance our intelligence and consciousness uh, rather than uh, enslave us. Now, see, that's interesting because Bruce talks a lot about the concept of lock-in and, you know, there's a suggestion of how, how, do you, how do you reconcile the optimism of the AI and this technology with the concept of lock-in and being enslaved by it? How do you guys uh, talk about that? Mm -hmm. Do you have any comments on that, Bruce? Uh, I have some comments. Yeah, but I've yeah, talked... no, Al, Al's, Al's way more important. Okay. Well, um, I... I think a lot of it, it depends on, on uh, whether or not you're at cause or at effect. You know, your, your, your state of mind determines how uh, you play with the technology. Uh, and I use Alexa all the time uh, for answering my problems and questions. I don't uh, dwell on the fact that uh, somebody might be uh, spying on me using it or somebody might be using it against me. So, uh, so my approach is, is more towards uh, how can I apply this technology uh, for enhancing my own experience? Um, and think of that first. It's too easy to come up with cautionary tales, how things can go wrong all the time, and then be a victim of that kind of thinking. So uh, you really, I find it's important to, to audit your own perceptions uh, and be aware of whether or not you're coming from fear or you're coming from um, a, a more creative space. Yeah. Al, I've, I've got a couple of uh, questions here because I, I you know, I'm, I'm a lawyer, so I, I like to argue both sides of everything, and I sure, always, yeah, yeah. and I do it with myself. And uh, <laughs> in in a talk I gave recently about AI, I, I mentioned there was this little girl. She was maybe like ten years old, and it was a holiday time. They're going around their 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 dining room table, a big family event, and they're they're saying prayers. And her prayer was, "Dear Alexis." Please take, please take care of our family this year. And to her, Alexa yeah. is God because it's always there, answers every question that she has. And so that's one side of it. But here's the other side that, that, that kind of bothers me about it. And, you know, I, I have a lot of friends that have it. I don't have it myself. But 
I know a lot of people have it, but the thing that bothers me is particularly with the young kids, they're so used to Alexa always there and listening on them. It's, it's giving them, it's conditioning them to be members of the surveillance society that they don't mind being surveilled all the time. I don't know if that's the case, but I worry about that a little bit. Yeah, that like they're um, they they could be the information could be used against them at some point. No, I I'm not. I don't really even care about that. What I'm I'm thinking is just their their idea that they don't have privacy. That, that I think privacy is kind of important to humans, and and these kids are growing up not you know recognizing that they have any privacy because Alexa is always over their shoulder. That that that's the thing that kind of bothers me about it. Yeah, you know, privacy is a funny thing. It's very personal. <clears throat> You know, it's really personal. And I think that <laughs> if they grow up with it, they yeah. just accept it in the same way that you, if you're a Catholic, you thought Jesus was there every second. Yeah, That's yeah, it. exactly. And, and, and here's, here's the thing, you know, I yeah. was, it's I was one of, I was one of those, those, those teenage boys that, that always looked at the angles. And if I was a teenage boy today, I would find, if my girlfriend had Alexa, I would become the world's best hacker, and I would be into her bedroom. I tell you that right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you'd probably be disenchanted. <laughs> oh, I'm sure I would have been, Charles. <laughs> no, there's, she's still kind of dumb compared to where I'd like to see her go. <laughs> she's no. Do you ever see the movie Her? The, yeah, the, yeah. Uh, they're not even close to that yet. You know, I mean, if if my Alexa was Scarlett Johansson. She'd be even more popular. Oh yeah. <laughs> no, and and you know, it, it, it's it's inevitable that AI is going to be part of our lives, and I think we're at a time where we get to decide what she does for us. You know, we get to help evolve her, and and it's not just the the po the pos the the, uh, the Alexa and the Siri and and uh, Google Voice. There's also other things going on, like there's open source AI right now too, where you can design your own. Uh, you know, if you if you have a proclivity for for coding, uh, so it's something that you can help shape right now. It's a, it's in a formative stage, and and that's an opportunity, not a problem. You're, well, you're right, I, and, and you know the consumers are shaping it as much as the programmers too, because uh, yeah. that's what they're they're interested in. So that's right. You know, right. I, I'm not saying that I'm against AI. I'm just saying that that perhaps the most uh, prescient person that we've ever had in the last uh, hundred years was Timothy Leary, who said, think for yourself and question authority. And the AI is becoming the new authority. And the psychedelic people are going to have to decide when to, uh, you know, question that authority and think for themselves. I, you know, I think that the, one of the things that Musk and those guys have been talking about really is about how um, a lot of the AI, the thing that they're scared of right now is that it'll take us apart from the people. So things like war and stuff is going to make it a lot easier because the further you can separate yourself from from actually having to shoot somebody like with a gun specifically, um, the easier it is to be able to call things like, hey, go do this or go, you know, uh, you know, and essentially we're getting to the point now where we may not even need drone pilots, where everything can kind of automate itself and they can figure out things on their own. And that's actually a little way more scary because at that point it's um it just becomes real easy for people to try to make those commands well, well i the, watch yeah, go ahead. i watch my kids and i see them interacting with their electronic devices on a regular basis and they and they're instantaneously connected with their friends and you know i guess with the you know with the internet with the you know the great interface even though we don't use alexa i mean they have siri on their phones but it seems like that's a natural thing that they're growing up with you that's know, right yeah and, and as a toss back you know we have you know terence mckenna used to talk about you know octopus octopi and how they would use ink in order to edit themselves <laughs> and you know we may need to be using you know developing techniques in order to to find our privacy I think we will. I, I think we, you know, if, if there's a point where these machines become too obnoxious, we'll we'll figure out how to do that. You know, um, I, I'm not I'm not too worried about that. I know enough hackers to know that uh, there are always a counterbalance whenever things get too far out of out of uh, out of balance. 
Al, what's your view on developing the thought leadership necessary for people to feel a sense of agency with the technology in their lives, that they actually have the sense that they can shape it to them? Let's put it in the psychedelic terms. It's your trip. You can tell the trip, you know, I don't want to go in this direction. How do we do that? How do we create that thought leadership so that people feel in control? I think by example, really, you, you set the example, monkey see, monkey do. We kind of... <laughs> We kind of learn by by uh, by doing so. So to show how you could utilize things, that, to show how to be at cause rather than at effect of events, uh, is is really important. And that's where what parents can do. That's what teachers can do. Uh, and there's some teachers that are better than others at demonstrating those principles. Uh, people that aren't as much ruled by fear as by uh, inspiration and fascination and and excitement about exploration. You know, people that have those that kind of mentality, uh, seek them, those kind of people out to be around. And you'll find, you know, you'll, you'll find your little cabal, your own little group, your caress, if you will, to do things with. That's, that's, what, that's why makerspace is so big and, and so important and why the maker, maker fair phenomena has really taken off around the globe. Because it's, it's, it's inspiring people to be at cause and to be creative together and to create new stuff and that you can create stuff too. It's not just, you know, for people that are, you know, they've got an, a university education uh, and good jobs to make things in the world. You know, it, it, uh, so I think the makers getting involved with local makerspace is another way to, to tune in to this. So that's, a, I think that'll be a good start. The, the old lead by example. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that, that's important. Yeah. And also find other people that you like to, to, to be creative with. Like right. I'm really into I'm really into drones, you know, and I'm having a lot of fun meeting interesting drone people um, in, in that world, and that's another area where I'm constantly dealing with more bureaucracy and more people telling me I can't fly my drone and stuff like that. I mean, I was on the state park the last week and and I was flying my drone and the, the ranger stopped and said, "You're not allowed to fly on state beaches," and I said, <laughs> "Really?" I said, "I didn't vote for that. I don't remember <laughs> voting for that. Do you?" No. <laughs> I'm glad to hear you're into drones, Al, because, you know, people don't realize if they don't know you, uh, you're also really into video. And oh, yeah, yeah. yeah my, my oldest son is, is, lives in Florida. He's into drones. And we're trying to work about a two or three year plan where he and I are both going to move to Orcas Island. And he's going to fly and I'm going to handle the video. And we, want to, we have a whole plan for stuff we want to do with nature videos and drones. So we'll have to uh, hire you to come up and uh, give us some uh, training, I think. Yeah, I, I just come, yeah, I'd love to. I'd love to hang out with you on this. It's a fascinating topic. And, uh, and there are new things all the time. Like just this week, I'm, I'm equipping my drone with, a, with a, what's called a mantis claw, you know, what? so it can grab things. It's oh, you, you can go down and pick stuff up? Yeah, yeah, it's like and picks things up. Like that little claw that you see in the arcade games where you pick up stuffed yeah. animals. And that, it, it's like that. Like, it's hanging on the bottom of my drone. And it doesn't require any power. You know, it's all done by gravity. And, and, it's a flying uh, crane game. <laughs> yeah, I can rest. It's a great way to get a lot of Amazon packages or something, right? Yeah, well, it's, you can't pick up that much. You know, maybe an ounce, you know, so little things. You can uh, you can uh, rescue another drone that's stuck in the top of a tree, for example. Oh, yeah, which is very handy. Or or if you accidentally crashed on top of a building you don't have access to, you know, it's a real bummer when that happens. But you know, when 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 we were out working uh, investigating yeah. the loss of the submarine Scorpion and yeah. Basquiat Trieste had one of those claws, just like you see in the arcade things. That's and, it. And you know, you can only see like two or three feet in front of the, the sphere because it's so dark down there. But they actually came right up upon the sextant from the scorpion, and they were able to use that claw and pick it up, and they brought the sextant back from 12,000 feet down. So uh, Awesome. Yeah. yeah. They yeah. work. They really work. <laughs> yeah. And, and it's the same technology. 20 bucks to get a claw on my drone. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's, it's the exact same technology. It's been around in movie theaters for, you know, 50 years. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it doesn't, it, it, it's funny. It, it doesn't, it's a combination of things that makes it new sometimes. Yeah. You know, you know and of course my friend over here wants a tractor beam, but good luck with that. 
Ah, here comes Gabby. Hey, Ray, Gabby. Do you have any uh, videos, drone videos out that you've uh, published? Down? I have, yeah. Up on Vimeo? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll send you a link. Or, or we can put them in the chat here and everybody can see them. Okay, yeah, I just, um, as a matter of fact, I just uh, uh, I was uh, flying my drone out here on the beach and I, I ran into uh, some farmers, you know, people who have big farms in the, you know, near Sacramento and they got all excited about drones and thought about how it could be used for pollinating plants and and stuff like that. Um, so I got I got shots of them uh, hanging out with me. There's some new mo modes where you can have the drone circle around you, like you know, right above, and get this nice circular shot of groups of people. It's pretty fun. I've you know. definitely had some um, uncomfortable experiences, like hiking around Joshua Tree at sunrise and someone's flying a drone around and it's so like you know it's only I'm one of the only people there and it's so loud and I know it's really uh, they're, they're getting better they, they, the, the latest version is it found that you can change the blade structure and reduce the sound 30 percent so mm -hmm. that's a start you know and and the noise has definitely got to be taken down some more but you know this Especially is in those still... natural settings where there's wildlife and stuff you know, yeah, it's, it's so loud for them too. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Loud, rather the the loudness is a problem. It's like the early days of cars before they had mufflers. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know that is so. It is an issue. As a matter of fact, I'd like to be able to change the pitch so it sounds pleasant. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and I've been thinking about that and how we could maybe do that to vacuum cleaners while we're at it. And <laughs> it sings John and Denver and when it Yeah. I mean, <laughs> there's some inventions there for audio that have wait it just can really change everything for all of us yeah you know involving sound for sure and the transmutation of sound from one frequency domain to another you know mm -hmm. surely that's possible especially with the uh, noise cancellation technology combined mm -hmm. you know so i agree with you i think we need to do something about that and we should make it a more a more uh pleasant experience mm -hmm. yeah well, i want to have an issue with it if um if it weren't if there weren't any noise involved but i could also see how some people might just feel uncomfortable having like a flying surveillance footage around them without their consent yeah you know? yeah yeah now that is true that does happen it does happen uh, however uh, that's just one out of the many uses uh, yeah. yeah most people just fly for fun you know you can also send uh you can send uh, medicines and, and drugs uh, to people oh, with it uh, you know, small, valuable, high quality. Yes, people want to know what kind of drugs. Well, whatever you want. It says it's your drug. It's your drone. It can, you can hold up it to an ounce. So huh? It can hold up to an ounce. So that's right. <laughs> and that that could make up for uh, its noise. Just, you know, <laughs> the fact that it can it can uh, deliver things. Yeah. And you know, the the consumer drones will now go about four miles, which is pretty good. Wow. Yeah, you can go across water. You can go across uh, where but there's no roads. Somebody stuck in a, in a on the other side of a of a, of a, a bridge that went out, for example. It can make a difference to them. Uh, so and and, and the, the thing is, is that I think it's a more valuable freedom to have your own drone than it is uh, a gun. And I, I say that it's it's more important than than gun rights because you know it it allow, it's more intelligent than a gun. Gun just sends you this stupid uh, piece of lead that can kill people. Uh, and that's great for what it does, you know, and, and not so great for what it does. Uh, but drones can deliver anything to anybody over a distance of several miles, you know? And, and so if they take away our freedom to own drones, which is being trying to be done right now, that is a worse thing to lose than, than, than guns. Uh, it's much more valuable. Uh, and besides, you can put a gun on a drone. So it's, it's guns are a subset of what drones can do. They're a mobile flying platform. They give you um, personal airspace. Uh, it's the idea of personal airspace that has not been recognized yet. Because we, we never had it. Never had it. You know, it hasn't existed until now. Um, and, and these drones will get better and better at doing things for us that we want them to do. You know, we'll all have personalized flying devices, much like we have cars today. You'll see. Um, we have a company here in, South, in, in uh, Silicon Valley, Santa Cruz Mountains here. That's, um, and they're just the tip of the iceberg. There's a, there's a half a dozen companies worldwide that are creating drones for transportation.
And that will change a lot. That will change everything. So um, is there any, I still, are, Al, are there any issues with like it, uh, the drones being in the airspace and then there's like airplanes also? Is that, do they know how to coordinate that situation? Because airspace, once you get high enough, it's pretty. No, no, this is the wild high. west, man. This is, yeah, they <laughs> can crash. That is a big problem uh -huh. for sure. Uh, this is the wild west still. We need to figure this shit out. And, and it, it requires um, technology like transponders. You know, that airplanes use already. Those are just chips. They can be in the drones. They can know where they are, especially uh, since they're trying to limit drones to 400 feet. And I, and I, I, got, a, I got a drone that can do 4,000 feet, right? And, and you're just supposed to fly it only within how far you can see. But mine can go four miles. So the, the already the technology is fast, cheap, and out of control. And, and, and there's no way it can be controlled. So why put ridiculous limitations on it to something that's fast, cheap, and out of control. It makes no sense. Uh, and, and so the, the rules have got to bend for this. And we've also got to create it so that there are good uses for it, not just bad uses. You know, we've got to think about how it can be applied uh, to, to serve us. Uh, there's enough people doing the other side, you know, already. I mean, we got this from the military, the tech. They already figured out how the death mind can use this. Uh, but we've got to look at life and how we can serve, you know, better existence with it. Uh, and that's the challenge is to not be ruled by the fear and really look at the creativity and how we can utilize these new technologies for our benefit. So, I mean, that, that's my soapbox on that. So. <laughs> no, I, I, I really, I really appreciate that. And I, I agree with it. You know, that particularly uh, I've seen some things that young kids are doing with drones that are just, just amazing. And then, then, you know, I, I, I go out to Vimeo and watch a lot of drone videos out there because they're so spectacular. And like in St. Petersburg, Russia, it's just some really amazing one. And then uh, a few months ago, we had a kid come in here. He's been here several times from St. Petersburg. And, uh, you know, we've had people, in fact, uh, Travis is here from uh, Wellington, New Zealand right now. And Antron from Montreal. Uh, there's uh, Jean from Saskatchewan. And so, you know, we're kind of a, a global community. And people are, are, I think the drones uh, has picked up here in the States, but I would suspect that uh, it's, it's not a, a U.S. phenomena because of all the stuff I've seen from Russia and places like that. Uh, how, how did you first get into drones, Al? Just uh, curiosity? Well, you know, I'm a geek, you know. I mean, I, I, I've been playing with uh, uh, computers for a long time. Um, I... I've all, I was into model rockets as a kid. I started a model rocket club. Um, so a flight was always fascinating to me. And it, it offered me a way to fly without having the, uh, the headaches of actually getting a pilot's license and spending pretty much big bucks to, uh, to learn how to fly. You know, it's, it, and with the goggles, when you put the goggles on, it's amazing. It's like an extension of your nervous system. You're, you're, you're wearing the goggles and the, the drone is flying and it's, it's, camera is your eyes i mean you literally are flying and it's not a joke it's for real you, you have control over it and that's the other point is that your nervous system when you adjust the camera and you fly to where you want to go and come back it's you it's like it's like how the car is an extension of your near nervous system uh the drone is an extension of your eyes in that sense uh, i've, I've got to have one I, i've got to have one <laughs> yeah you got to get the goggles uh they're really huge it's called fpv or front first person view and the the, the dji has some really nice ones uh, that are high definition and uh, the, the the drone will turn when you tilt your head like that the drone the 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 the, the, the aircraft does that too so well, turn left and right you know forward and go up it, it's like it's like a lucid dream i i would bet that you could probably create a, a program to teach you to have better lucid dreams with a drone. You know, you could fly through uh, psychedelic landscapes with it and start to create dream experiences when you're actually flying. And now now there, there is really something, you know, and, and you know, I'm, I'm two or three years away from being able to afford a drone. I've got other projects I gotta do first, but, but now, now you really got my attention because you know how Terrence kept talking about programming uh, virtual reality, you know, with psychedelic experiences. But I'm thinking now of flying through an ayahuasca experience or some of my mushroom trips and all. Uh, heck, yeah. I, you, yeah, you, you convinced me to stay alive for another 30 years so I can see this stuff come to fruition, you know? 
<laughs> so DMT is a uh, Steam game, just to let you know. The other thing that if, you, if you're really into drones, one thing that you really want to get a chance to watch is, one, watch the South Park so you know what not to do. And the second one is go to eBay, or not eBay, go to YouTube, look at some of the, uh, the racing videos. Um, if you look at some of the way that some of these guys race through the warehouses, it's amazing. Yeah, oh my gosh. It's like who does the, that. Star Wars, it's great. It is. It's awesome. It's. A, I have a 27-year-old uh, friend, a woman, a woman, I believe it. She's one of the top pilots in the world. She lives here in Santa Cruz, and she always looks at whatever building we're in, whether or not how she's going to fly through it, and with which aircraft is best for that flight. There's, there's a whole new cr uh, uh, class of super small drones called Big Whoop. You know, <laughs> Big Whoops. You can look it up. And Big Whoops are little tiny insect-sized drones with cameras that you put on your glasses and you fly through. Uh, bars, you know, in, 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 in you know, hab uh, inhabited environments, and nobody barely notices them. They're like insects, um, and they're really fun. And those are here and now? It's available yeah, now? Yeah, they're here now. Yeah, big wood. Wow. You can find, look, look it up on Amazon. You can buy them for 100 bucks. Yeah, th this is, I, I kid you not, it's fast, cheap, and out-of-control stuff, and it gives us new freedoms, you know, that, that's, uh, that's truly exciting. <laughs> I think I'm using, and I, I did, did you have something, Gabby, do you want to add to this? Oh, I was just saying that electronics don't work on, on iOS, so remember. Oh, okay. Well, let's, uh, I, 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 Lorenz, are you there? Yeah, yeah. I, I was actually going out looking for Big Whoop is what I was doing here. Oh, but, okay. yeah, I'm, no, I'm, I'm big, look for Little Whoop. Little, uh, little, little Whoop, whoop. okay. <laughs> yeah, there's both. There's both. I, I have a friend, my friend uh, Gabrielle is here from New Jersey. She has held her own psychedelic salons in, in yeah. the Philadelphia area. And, uh, and we, had, we had done ayahuasca at one point, and uh, she reminded me of one very important thing. Um, you know, Alan is always connected to electronic devices. Whenever he's anywhere, there are things hanging from him, things in his pockets, all over. And we're having this amazing experience. It was on his property, and um, it was dark out, and he said, wait, I want to record what's happening. And none of his things would work. Everything malfunctioned, like nothing would work. And I said, Alan, it doesn't want you to, <laughs> it doesn't want you to record this, you know? And, and, and so, yeah, it, it's just nothing. And he was just so, he, he couldn't let go of his stuff. And I was like, this is the lesson, Alan. It's teaching you, <laughs> you, know, you, you, uh, you, you have to let it go for now. And he's like, okay all right okay and you know i was finally able to put it down and uh go on with the experience yeah. well, that's true yeah. <laughs> technology does have its limits and uh, these higher states of consciousness the technology fails you know the batteries die i mean there's a lot of mysterious things that happen really. so alan maybe yeah. maybe you can relate to this i i have had on a few occasions when when i've had a, a serious crash couldn't get on the net, couldn't boot up, couldn't get anything going. I knew I was a couple of days away from recovering. And I got yeah. deeply depressed as if somebody died that I knew. Do you feel that way? When uh, it doesn't work? I sometimes have felt really down. But, I, I mean, I look at the depressions as more <clears throat> like a weather pattern. And it's often not associated with anything in particular that's happening in my life. It, and it usually goes away. And it must be some kind of biochemical weather pattern. That, but, that goes through the brain. But it's not technology that gets you down when it crashes, no, huh? No, it does. well, right now my computer, my laptop is in for repair for the first time in, in four years. And I, I know a lot about this stuff and I had to bring it into somebody who knows more than me. So that's a, that's I, a serious I, failure there. <laughs> that's why I'm on my phone right now <laughs> talking to you. I don't have the, I can't see everybody like you can. Yeah, you know, Ke Kevin's on his phone driving right now. It's somewhere in the middle of the country. Yeah. All right, Kevin. Where where are you right now, Kevin? Uh Kentucky. <laughs> Kentucky. <laughs> In a state that it's legal to drive with your phone like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if if you can't see Al, there's like thirty people here in the room with us right now. And uh we're we're doing this every Monday night now, and and I'm starting a a, a, a guest invite list. I send this out to the people on Patreon every week because uh, I have to have a different URL. I started I tried to do this for free and opened it up to everybody, and it was a really unbelievable zoo. I think uh, Kevin and Charles and David and a couple of people were there. You know, we had 
one woman taking her clothes off and other guys shouting up 70s and <laughs> it lasted about five minutes and so so every week I send out a new URL and I've, I've put you guys on this list that I well I put you on this list that I just started tonight <laughs> and hey, every, every Monday I set up a new room here at noon and, and you'll be on the distribution list and we'd love you guys to drop in whenever you want to that uh, I'm going to try to have uh, featured guests here from time to time, like uh, Bruce Damer, who hasn't said a word yet tonight. <laughs> yeah, he's here. He's waiting. He's ready. He's, uh, he's got some exciting well, to, you know, yeah, he's, um, yeah, he's got some great stories to share with you guys. No, well, Bruce, Bruce was the bait to get all these people in here tonight, but I did get emails from a few people that said they wanted to ask him a question. So I guess I guess we ought to see if anybody has a question for Bruce while we're here. Uh, yeah, so why don't you introduce I got Bruce, a funny Andrew? question for Bruce. Yeah. All right, listen, people already know of you, okay? There, there's Bruce. Who, who, who ought to go first with a question for Bruce? I'll, I'll go first if you don't mind, Lorenzo. Go ahead, Houston, yeah. Hey, hey, guys, what's up? Bruce, uh, it is a pleasure to uh, talk to you, and I'm a huge fan. I've seen you last in 2017 at the uh the eclipse festival when you did your origin of life speech oh yeah i was, uh, oh, wonderful. I yeah. was the uh, guy in the background on mushrooms probably yelling like yeah <laughs> 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 um, i'm was, sure there was more than one houston <laughs> i'm sure yeah i'm sure yeah so uh my question would be um you know just listening to your podcast a while back when you did uh we're on joe rogan and he was challenging you to you know say oh you know the direction of technology and how that can interface with biology and you're trying to get to the point or trying to tell him hey you don't understand how complex biology is and there's no way that these projects are even started because you know like you know people who are doing projects similar to that um and you know this is kind of a fantasy of all of us psychedelic people to talk about that with uh, how you know technology is going to propel us whether it's going to enslave us or or not but um since then you've since you've done that interview have you come across anything new or anything that would change your mind on that um state or the stance that you took basically about the singularity yeah 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 the singularity i th i think we are the singularity okay so yeah it, that's true it, in a sense like um it's happening what is happening. So what we're doing, I think we're shaping, we're shaping probability faster and faster. I've, I've been doing talks in the last year about, uh, we found this thing at the origin of life, which is this little nugget of, it's an engine that starts turning that, that creates biology out of physics. And we found it and it's a three way cycling engine. And this thing is, is still the only thing that cycles everything into existence. You know, it's, it's, it does biology, it does, does technology, it does uh, culture, and it probably drives spiritual experience and visionary experience too. So now we're teasing this little nugget apart because it works in chemistry. And it, it may be the, the, the Genesis engine. I, I gave it the name, the Genesis engine or the engine of creation. And, and this thing, what it does is it's a spiraling mechanism that it cycles and stacks probability on top of each of itself. And we're sitting on a 4 billion year high stack of, of improbable events becoming actual. Like this phone that I'm holding is a, if you had it floating out in the universe, it is so unlikely is to you'd have a hundred trillion universes would never self-assemble this phone without the power of, of this generative engine. And so it's it's a thing that I've been taking around the world and fielding with different audiences. And I think it, it, it creates a field, it creates a probabilistic field that we all float in. And that with our intentions, we can shape that field. So so like for instance, when I decided to work on the origin of life when I was 14, I knew that I could shape a tunnel of probability ahead of me as long as I kept my focus on, on my my intention. So, so that's, oops, Apple ID verification okay? code. Oh, there we go. 
<laughs> so I don't know, I'm, I'm rambling here, but I think when we think about, when, when, when people come up with technological singularities, and I had this discussion with Terrence a lot in the late 90s, I think they're putting too much power in digital technology. Digital technology is incredibly underpowered compared to biology and the living world. And biology and the living world are, are, are massively, they're six orders of magnitude more powerful than a computing system. And I think we're just now understanding the, the, this field, this, this, this probabilistic field and, and you as, as journeyers, you're in that field and, and you find that it's variegated and that it is infinite and that it is astonishing, you know? But I think that we, may, we mentally can shape the probabilistic field. And it's like, for instance, on Saturday, I'm flying to the country of Qatar in the Middle East uh, as a guest of the government to go and present to them several visions of how they could invest in, in technology and fly Shepard CubeSats, for example, in low Earth orbit. And there's a, there's a, a, a solution to all viral disease that has come out of our lab at UC Santa Cruz that, that could actually uh, block all viral action in, in the body. And I'm looking for investors. So I'm doing the active shaping of, rel we call it realm bending, active shaping of that field to draw in resources for those two things and and it works it works every time it's just amazing it, and 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 phones have <laughs> shaped the field even more i mean this smartphone has accelerated you know art values to talk about the quickening but oh my god you know he had no idea about this quickening thing how quick it could get quicker Bruce, anyway, Bruce, I'm, Bruce, I'm Bruce let, here, let, let me let me step in for just a moment here, Bruce, because you just mentioned three things <laughs> that all came out in my podcast <laughs> yesterday. I the last two podcasts I've done were Terrence McKenna Art, on Art Bell in March of '98. So there's McKenna Art Bell, and then what you're talking about shaping our field. Terrence said ex almost exactly the same thing in that. <laughs> We've got to write our own stories. And I, I see the two of you saying the same thing a few years apart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Goodness. Well, there you go. Goodness yeah. gracious. I'm going to put I'll a credit off the question. Then. Okay, so, hey, I have a, I have a <laughs> counter question to that real quick. So, I, I honestly believe that humanity is kind of on this path. So, that we're, we're, we're moving forward that regardless if we had Newton or Einstein, that sometime a sentient race would discover physics, that we would go to the moon that there are these things that we would eventually assemble a phone that like, while I don't know about the transcendental object at the end of time, I do think he was onto something. And if you look at all of humanity as a Goliath, the path that we've taken from wherever we've gone, no matter what the society was, I still think we would have reached the moon, whether it was now a thousand years from now or 2000 years from now that somehow we would have gotten to a phone, that we would have gotten to the moon, regardless, just because of the fact that we think we would have discovered these things. What do you think about that? Well, um, you know, it's, I think we only have one data point. We only have one path through the probabilistic field. And what I enjoy doing often is, to blow my mind, you know, you can blow your mind in many ways, but one of the ways you can blow your mind is looking at how improbable all of this is. Like the fact that, that we got to the moon because if you, if you, you can, you can take the dominoes and go all the way back because a guy named Goddard was setting off these model rockets and inspired a guy named Von Braun who happened to get sponsored by a crazy regime and a huge war and got funded rapidly to make, uh, to even design a multi-stage rocket. And then he got snatched up by another country, which then accelerated his development even more such that he built the rocket that went to the moon, you know, in a single human lifetime. This guy was alive to watch an entire field develop. This is Werner von Braun and, and the, the incredible unlikelihood of even getting to the moon in 1969, you know, uh, against all odds, and then everything else, jet travel and, and understanding the genome, all 
and, and, and Alan and Son and I were just talking today that 1990 marked a revolutionary moment. There's videos of this showing an Apple Macintosh 2 running a 240 by 180 black and white video, right? It was the first personal computer that could run a video that, I don't know what it was, 15 frames a second. And that's 19, yeah, if you're lucky. And it could play a, a song. It could play a song on a, on a, it was a Macintosh 2, 1990. And, and you think of it like, oh my God, you know, we look at what we're doing right now. You know, and, and the breathtaking progress of, of semiconductor. And, you know, Right now we're, we're looking at, we, our model of the origin of life actually teaches us where life can start. We need rocky planets with oceans and subaerial land masses, and we need certain types of climate, and we need cycling hydrothermal fields, et cetera, et cetera. But the unlikelihood of complex life is just breathtaking. You know, we, complex multicellular life on planets arising on planets is probably just extremely excruciatingly rare and 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 in a sense it's not like the church lady that we're special you know but we kind of are special uh and i i just one of these days i'm going to quit all my travels and i'm going to quit everything and just sit in contemplation of how weird and amazing all this is you know just yeah what are the odds? And, I mean, and us like crazy that. monkeys got microorganisms on Mars. <laughs> yeah, we <laughs> accidentally. I, accidentally. Yeah, I, 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 the Madre was having a hard night one night, and I, I took her to Mars, and I took the belly pan off this, the Opportunity rover, and I showed her that we had already brought in bacteria there, and that we were, we were going to spread life in the cosmos. You know, we'd already done it unwittingly. And did you like that? Yeah, she was like, okay, you know, I'll... She had given those reptiles 250 million years to do something. <laughs> what did they know, do? Let, let, me, let, me, let me do my lawyer thing here and, and play the devil's advocate because usually I'm the guy that's making lemonades out of everything and everything's rosy and cheery. And, and it is, it's just incredible that, that these upright talking apes have set their foot on the moon They've harnessed the power of the sun, and yet, and when Courtney mentioned the Joshua tree a few minutes ago, I got really saddened because under this shutdown that we're in, the Joshua Tree National Park has been destroyed. I mean, they're cutting down the trees, and the it's the park is a mess. It's not going to ever recover from what's happened here in the last three weeks. And so that's the other side of these amazing apes that gone to the, have gone to the moon is we still haven't been able to control ourselves uh, among among ourselves you know there's 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 still too much ape in these uh, sapiens I'm afraid yeah and it um, it turns out and, and this is really interesting here's an interesting fact for you guys uh, it's in the latest scientific American did you know that of all the apes pretty much we're the only ones that move and exercise and do all the stuff we do the rest of them chimps included, bonobos, mountain gorillas, everything, they pretty much lie around all day. You know, they're, they're, they, yeah, they, uh, they're incredibly sedentary and they stay healthy, even though they have high cholesterol content and things like that. But we were thrown out of Eden onto the plains of Africa where we had to literally, we had, the, the way we hunted was we ran our prey to exhaustion. So we are built to run. We, this is why sedentary humans is a bad, bad thing. We die of heart disease. Uh, apes don't die of heart disease and they lie around all day. But we're the only non-sedentary ape. We're the only anxious ape. Anxious ape. <laughs> we're the anxious, overdriven, hyper-driven, unbelievably hot-blooded, oversexed, uh, you know, Whatever well, we are, we're, we're in, totally in, different than other In my old age, I'm doing my best to honor my ancient heritage of being sedentary. <laughs> 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 I, I do go out and exercise every day, but only under duress. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I'm running from dogs. You're running from dogs? Dogs keep us going. Man. <laughs> are there any other animals that have such 
complex. We have a question here from Gabby here. I mean, are there any other are there any other animals that have um, such complex, um, you know, problem solving abilities? I would say, um, you know, that's also unique because not only not only do we have this energy that's in a body with directed consciousness and sensory perception, but we also have the ability um, to solve problems um, in a complex fashion. And I think that really sets us apart from a... Yeah, what, what do you have to say about that, Bruce? I mean, uh, we are extraordinary, uh, but, but we're, we, it's amazing we're everything. We're extraordinarily brilliant and perceptive and invent inventive, but we're extraordinary in our ability to self-deceive and to manipulate our kind and to manipulate the natural world. We're, we're just good at everything. I mean, <laughs> you know, just... but let, let, let me comment on what, what Gabby said, because I know there are, are some uh, crows that do things with tools, but on a very small scale, my, my wife has this little, little multi-poo dog. And the other day, the dog has one of these, these antler horns, kind of a big thing for her. And she was trying to get a hold of it. And she picked it up and looked around and pushed it down the slot on the seats of the cushions. And she pushed it between the slots. And then she sat there and chewed on it. So to me, that's sort of a problem-solving <laughs> ability yeah, with a dog good. whose brain is like, you know, <laughs> walnut size. And uh, I've read about, uh, you know, about crows and other things and nothing, you know, like Bruce said, nothing on the scale of what we're doing. But uh, right. on the other hand, it must be some sort of an innate uh, animal tendency to try to solve problems. And we just got really good at it. Uh, you know, I, I've been taken lately with two books, uh, Sapiens and uh, Homo Deus. And uh, the, the, those two books to me are two of the most important books I've read because they've really put together everything I've read in the last, you know, 70 years. And, and I, I see how our Homo sapiens, we've been here for 30,000 years as the only human species, but that's unusual. Usually there's five or six different human species here. And, and I'm wondering if these, uh, the indigo children that came around that are now growing up where they've never been alive without the internet and without a cell phone, uh, I'm wondering if we aren't uh, speciating, uh, having a bifurcation here of some sort. Yeah, a, 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 some kind of a, a mutation point, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. yeah and, and, and we've got to be careful talking about that because then you go back into the, the Nazis and everything else. But I, I don't think we're creating anything. I think that they're evolving on their own. And, and uh, you know, one of the things about speciation, it's not about genes. It's about uh, diet and sex. Uh -huh. And... Uh, you know, some of these young kids, uh, hey, John, how are you? Long time no see. Yeah, why don't you, why don't you introduce John to everybody? He's the, the, he is the man who first brought Burning Man off of the playa into the rest of the world. <laughs> one, one of the first. Okay. Well, I'll give you credit. I, I'll give, yeah, I'll give your team credit. How's that? Yes. We're good. <clears throat> yeah, we're just talking about, we'll be at a mutation point where our species will uh, have a serious uh, speciation. <laughs> Uh, are we talking about uh, the bifurcation of time or or, uh, or DNA? No, I don't. I don't think it's a change in DNA. I think it's a change in 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 culture, in in attitudes of how you you eat and live and work. You know, there's there's a uh, hi Tom. There, there's several studies of where uh, a couple species are genetically identical, but they're separate species. They don't reproduce with one another. So uh, that could be going on. But in any event. Uh, these kids that are growing up with Alexa in their house and a cell phone in their hand, you know, they they have an advantage over us old guys <laughs> in the new world. Oh, oh, there we go. All right. We, uh, we just have a bunch of visitors just arriving here. So we're just uh, just making everyone feel I, I, I should. Detail, so we're, you know, yeah. Al, I finally figured out you're in Santa Cruz because in in uh, in Bruce's email he he just said SC and I thought oh gosh what are you guys doing in South Carolina because usually on Monday nights we have, we have a guy Mally usually shows up here from South Carolina I thought you're at his house <laughs> yeah you know, use a VPN man <laughs> yeah <laughs> let's see if I can get this up on the screen again she's not seeing my Apple TV. Hmm. Okay, I'm trying to show everybody uh, everybody on the screen here. We have a quite an audience. 
um, out there. Lorenzo, you really, you've got a lot of really, a lot of amazing people I see online already. It's kind of exciting. And unfortunately, I can only look at you all by scrolling through the list yeah. to show it to Bruce. Yeah, it, yeah. I, on, a, on a web interface, it puts a mosaic out. You can see everybody at the same time. And, and uh, uh, you know, we're still learning how to do this. I've been doing it for almost a year now. And uh, yeah. it, there, it's, it's growing and, and getting uh, more interesting, especially when we can have uh, people like you and, and Bruce and, and have a sort of a featured uh, guest uh, next week uh, Matt Palomary is going to be here and then uh, I've got a man who has a ayahuasca resorts uh, retreat in uh, South America is going to be here and some people that did a documentary uh, documentary about the Shipibo and what my plan is is to to I'm going to do these every Monday night and then from time to time I'll, I'll take and uh, pull the audio off of them and and we'll podcast them so a wider audience can see it too so uh uh, and, and by the way, Al and Bruce and any of you people, anybody wants the, the audio or video of this, uh, I, can, I can send it to you. They, what happens with Zoom is they, uh, at, when we sign off, they download a video and audio uh, to my computer here. And so I've got it if anybody wants it. So uh, Yeah, I'd love a piece of it because I'd like to play some of it on my radio show tomorrow. Okay, okay. I'll, what I'll do is... Uh, Yes, yeah, I'll, I'll, a, layer, uh, a layer of information. I'll I'll yeah. uh, I'll put it up in a, a Dropbox so you can you guys can get it there or something like that. So, well, Lorenzo, I want to put a plug in for convergence in Orcas Island because uh, uh, we were just in Chiang Mai, uh, Thailand, with Darren Long, who's the organizer of convergence. Uh, Imagine convergence coming up third week of March, and the tickets are selling fast. So uh, it's going to be fantastic. Paul Stamets is giving two talks. Oh, really? Uh, two yeah. talks, and there's there's so many great people, and it's going to be intimate and fantastic arts and music and uh, just great. So everybody, and of course we have Lorenzo on the ticket there. And and this is this is a major milestone for me because uh, I'm I'm bringing my youngest or my youngest my oldest son is coming up there with me, uh, you know he's single has no kids lives in Florida wants to get out of there and so if he likes Orcas Island, then my plan is to help him move there and then in a couple of years I'm going to join him so, <laughs> the, the convergence festival is the first day of the rest of my life and I'm starting a whole new. Uh, uh, launching thing. I'm, I'm going to be here for another three or four years until the grandkids get through high school, but uh, uh, I want to get my son established, and and next month, I'm putting everything I own, except for my clothes and my computer, you know, in a shipping container, and I'm putting it in storage until I move to Orcas, so I'm going to be living as a hermit for the next couple of years, and uh, uh, knock out a couple of books I have to finish, and uh, then go up there, but Convergence is the beginning of it all, so uh, I'm looking forward to seeing some of you there. I know Charles is going to be there and a couple other people. So uh, uh, it should be a great time, like you said, Bruce. And, and there's a special thing that we're launching at Convergence. And the three of us, the co-designers of this, are going to be wearing them. They're called spiritual flight suits. <laughs> spiritual <laughs> flight suits. And you'll see, uh, you'll see them in the news. And they basically, uh, this is like Lorenzo's hat here. I, I was going to bring this too. This is my Team Shulgin hat. <laughs> I don't know if you can see it. It's team Shulgin up there. And at night, it has these little headlights so you can see your way around. <laughs> I don't know if I'll bring that or not. Since you're having suits, I don't, I don't want to uh, outstage you, Bruce, with my hat. <laughs> these are going to be like full-on Air Force, uh, spiritual Air Force with patches and badges of honor and everything, kind of like, you know, like if you were, if you're on a special mission and you come back and you get, you get your badge of courage or just simply getting back. Uh, but anyway, more on that later. No, he's gone off to get another. I've got some uh, DMT, uh, Flight suit badges. I send you for those things. You do? Uh, oh do, my god! Yeah. Can you send those so we can get? I, I can. Yeah, absolutely. I'll get some oh. info from Lorenzo. Get one to you oh. for sure. And guys, guess what the first badge is going to be? And it's something you guys have never seen. It's Terrence McKenna McKenna's personal logotype. 
uh, which which I found on a collection of letters that I have from Terrence for 15 years of letters. And what it is, it's a it's a cap. It's like a, a, a mushroom cap, and below is the body of the of an octopus, and the <laughs> tentacles come out, and there's eyes in the stem. And it was Terrence's personal logo that was on his letterhead, and so we've turned it into a badge, into a patch. That's a shroom. We call it Octo Shroom. <laughs> and it'll be it's badge number one, limited edition for spiritual flight suit. I'm, so. I'm going to uh, bring my my jacket with badges. Maybe I could put it on there. I don't know if you guys know that. I have a commercial pilot's license. Restricted to hot air balloons, and that's actually my balloon. <laughs> so I I want one of those patches to put on my balloon jacket, Bruce. Oh wow! Okay, so everyone's into this. This is good. This is Rosma's right, Rosma's <laughs> business. Uh, Rosma's idea of spiritual flight suits, and um, and they'll be sold at festivals, and you'll be able to custom make them, and and whatever. But anyway, uh, more on that at, at convergence. Well, once once you get that all rolling out, we'll have to do something with it here in the salon on Monday nights and uh, give a badge to everybody that shows up or something. You know? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> does any Does anyone else have any more questions? Uh, I've got a got? question I'd like to ask. Um, basically, we're talking about we've been talking a lot tonight about technology and how and we're all in love with like how fast things are going and so on. And I'm concerned about like future generations, you know, the kids that are coming up, the kids, you know, my kids and, you know, and potentially grandkids at some point. And how do you see us like training our kids for this world that they're going to inhabit? Now, I know you're in the Santa Cruz area and the one group I do know of that does a lot of really good work is located there. I don't know if you're well familiar with uh, John Young and the Eight Shields Institute. Uh, but they do a lot of wilderness training uh, that teaches kids to learn from animals and by tracking animals and so on, which is so not technological, yet these are the, they're developing the skill sets that allow the, them to step into their full evolutionary consciousness. And I was wondering what you think about those what do you think? What do you think? What type of advice would you give to people who are raising children? I think that if you can at all pull your kids away from their devices and get them to do other things than than the stimulus response of screens, which drives a huge amount of dopamine production and adrenaline production, but doesn't give you oxytocin. You know, we're we're in a we're 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 driving hard uh, the drugs that aren't about connection. Uh, oxytocin being the connection drug um, it's it's in a way uh, I have a I have a young friend who's 22 years old and he counsels high school kids that are on Ritalin and Adderall and things like this because he was prescribed it when he was 11 and it totally changed his consciousness we felt you know he has what we call chemical consciousness and he he, he literally goes into high schools and, and junior schools and and works with kids that have been prescribed just off the cuff uh, to control their their passions or whatever and they're just their consciousness is shot right from from all these methamphetamines and i asked him well what happens when these kids grow up and and they come into the workforce and they take over companies and countries and things like this and he said oh i hate to inform you but you're already living in their world Twitter and Facebook and they're these are all riddle and that are all kids and, and these are all kids raised on devices they're you're living in their reality now so you so you're saying we get Trump yeah. yeah I think Trump is outside of that in, in a way he's he's old school like he's a dinosaur right he's not he's a user but he wasn't raised with it so but can you you know one day we're going to have a, a millennialist president we may actually have someone well, my millennial friends say that there's three kinds of them. Like they are self-described as there's the ones that are completely tweaked. They're completely tweaked out. And there's another set uh, that are kind of in the a drone mode. And there's a third set are, that are super knowledgeable that are, their consciousness is like absorbed like a crystal. They're like crystal beings and they've absorbed the whole freaking internet and all the social 
mores and all the videos and everything and they've seen everything and he describes uh, those friends of his as the yeah right people because everything you say to them they say yeah right because they've already seen the entire scope of everything around your statement and all the contradictions in it and yeah right you know they have these crystal brains and just got everything and they just know everything they're spock's brains and so maybe that's the that's the world we're going in i mean they're inheriting our world so uh but if they don't have contact with nature if they don't you know um there's a there's a community house across the hill where you know the dishwasher or the clothes machine just kept jamming up because the people that live there don't understand sort of how to run a dishwasher you know or how to run appliances because they were raised in 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 in, in situations where everything was done for them so that's a problem you end up not making people that are independent or can 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 live independently they become wards of the state in a way um yeah but you know we're getting the world we're we're, we're getting the world that's emerging around us, you know, but this has always been the way in a way. I mean, people worried about television. They worried about too much book reading. They worried about the telephone as having deleterious health effects in the 1920s and radio, that radio was going to destroy society, you know, commercial radio by 1929. Uh, it, it just, it, in a sense, I think that the primate brain probably has a capacity to take a huge amount of new stories, new conditioning, and new speeds. And, and, and we don't really know the limit of it yet. There's a hint in the limit of what the primate brain can do is, was in the Mir space station project. Because at one point, there was a commander of the Mir space station, and he was so overloaded by the sheer number of tasks to keep the aging station in orbit with all the problems that it had, that he was actually pi piloting the Progress resupply ship to dock with Mir, and he blacked out. He completely he passed out because his brain went through cognitive overload. There was just too much going on. And then the, the Progress uh, passed the docking port and slammed into the Spectre module. It was a multi-ton spacecraft, so it, it tweaked the airlock. And then the American on board, his name is Foley, realized that the commander was completely, he had reached cognitive overload and he was gone. And he had to take an ax and cut all the cabling to the Spectre module to get the door shut to keep them from dying because it was, the station was decompressing. And, and that, was, that was sort of a limit, you know, that humans, there is an upper limit to how much stuff we can process, how much messaging, how, how many interrupts and things like that. And, and then our brain shut down actually. Yeah, Bruce, but, Bruce, Bruce, do you remember back a uh, number of years ago when you got into almost that situation? You were multitasking for like 18 hours with three or four uh, uh, <laughs> links going at the same time in, in that virtual uh, world. Yeah. In virtual world. Remember that? Yeah, yeah, man. That was, that was intense. I was mush. I was in bed for a week because I, I had to run a cyber conference in 1998. We had 800 simultaneous users in, in a three-dimensional space. Sun and Alan were there. John might have been there. I, I gave a talk. I, I, I set up a talk room there. <laughs> yeah, and, that, and it was, it's actually something that's never been equal. You know, that, that's a surprising thing. Like Second Life couldn't handle that many users in one space. The Active Worlds could. It was weird. It was a modem base. But I, I had to cognitively manage the entire complex hall where everybody was what they were doing and i would fly my avatar and teleport around and, and there's michael nismith from the monkeys walking around and make sure he's got to go to the right place and there was all these people john graham's video on the wall showing different locations and it was but, awesome but my brain was mush i'll tell you at the end bruce i i took your description of that and and i actually i've included it in my book the spirit of the internet as part of my evidence that the internet is a psychedelic substance. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and then, then, of course, we did that uh, experiment with Terrence in his house where we built the, the very trip to mean world. Remember that? The oh, yeah. Built and then Terrence went into the world and took people on trips there. And, and at one point he turns around and says to Finn McKenna, I'm doing the Macarena 
and I'm the bug eye green lawnmower. <laughs> you know, I'm I'm toying with the idea of using his his handle of Zone Ghost as a character in my next novel. <laughs> you should, you know, I found it in one of these letters that has the octave room on the top. I found the first reference to Zone Ghost. Oh, really? Yeah, and that was Terence's dream uh, presence in cyberspace. That it was actually his identity in trip space too. So that was his secret identity. His secret name was Zone Ghost. And so when we actually put him into Virtual Worlds at 99, we actually named him Zone Ghost. Uh, so he got to realize his dream and he was gone in a year. I mean, that was the, yeah. that, was, that was his experience of tech novelty, we called it, his great experience of tech novelty. I, 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 I need to rewind a bit here because in, early on in the conversation tonight, and Al was talking about Mondo 2000, uh, the people here who have actually uh, heard my, a lot of my podcasts uh, maybe remember the story about when I first heard about Terrence McKenna, and it was in Mondo 2000, uh, and it was an article that uh, Zandor wrote, and then it was in Al's house uh, up on the mountain where I met Zandor, had uh, sit next to Zandor for dinner one night. So, and, and actually Zandor and I are still in, in contact. Uh, in, yes, yes, she and I are still in contact, but we, Amar, we have to- Amara's create... here, by the way. Oh, Amar, tonight? Amara's coming tonight, yeah. Oh, give her my love. She and I have corresponded a little bit. Bring her up. Amara will come and, and this is the old home. That's why with Lorenzo, I said this would be like old home week. I guess. You know, if, if it hadn't been for her article, I never would have heard of Terrence McKenna. <laughs> so, so Amara invited Son and Alan to do the interview with Terrence for Mondo, which led you to be sitting right doing what you're doing. And, and not only do I still have that copy of Mondo, I've got every issue of Mondo, although the, the first three, I had to go back and buy them as uh, Xerox copies. I, I started with issue four myself as a subscriber, but I have a complete set of Mondo that will be in my pod that'll one day wind up on Orcus. So uh, if you ever want to see Mondo, I'm going to start a library on Orcus one day, and you guys can come up and peruse it. <laughs> and Allison Kennedy has been down to Boulder Creek several times to visit Nick Her Herbert. And we interviewed her for two hours in the Digibarn as she looked at Reality Hackers, oh. which was the predecessor to Mondo. And right. Amara, Amara, come come over here. Amara, come and sit here because Lorenzo Haggerty wants to say hello. Okay, so so here we are. We're on a Amara psychedelic salon gathering. And we were just talking about Mondo 2000. And, and the interview with Terrence McKenna. Sound familiar? The interview with Terrence McKenna. Your, ter your interview. I, remember, I, I sent you that article and you said I shouldn't really publish it. But <laughs> and I haven't. I, I've kept yes. it. But uh, you're the one that told me about Terrence. And then uh, uh, years later, at Al's house, we sat ne next to each other for dinner. And I'm telling you about, oh, I read Mondo 2000. And you said, oh, yeah, I'm the one that wrote that. <laughs> so I owe you a huge debt of gratitude. The secret is out. <laughs> <laughs> this is old home week. <laughs> well, you guys have quite a crowd there tonight up there in Santa Cruz. Uh, we, we do. We've got. Son yeah. there, Alan. Hey, yeah. son. You in a virtual hey, reality hey, as we speak here. Alan, Alan, Alan's, son. Alan's, Alan's, putting, son's, Alan's putting you in spherical VR right now. Yeah, yeah we have our VR meeting your VR. Well, I, I have something that I, I would like to tell you guys in Santa Cruz tonight. I have a focus for your party tonight. Do, oh. you, know, do you know what happened? Uh, let's see. Uh, Let's see, 60, the focus for the party. 67, 80, 77, 87, 97, 52 years ago today, Al, what happened? Uh, on uh, six, yeah. January 17th. And, 14th. Uh, no, I mean, 14th, the digital 14th, B, 14th. The, the B in. The B in. Oh, it was, it was 52 day. years ago today. Yes, yeah. January 14th, 67. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah. so you go to CES and then that will. So, so the, the yeah. digital BN, but the human BN was January 14th, oh, 1967. Yeah. 
For the digital band, we would always do in January. Yeah, we were doing that too. With Michael yeah, Dosby. Yes, of course, you would remember the original Billy Band. We did a yeah. big party last year. Yeah, or, yeah the 50 year anniversary. Yeah, this, this is 50. This is 52 Lorenzo, now. Lorenzo, you were at the Summer of Love, right? But you were in uniform heading I, for your ship or something? I was I was there that morning because we, we always, I was, my ship was in Hunter's Point Shipyard and my wife and three-year-old son and I would go down and throw uh, stuff to the ducks at, at uh, Golden Gate Park. And we're down there and, you know, I have my Navy haircut on and my little kid and everything. And <laughs> the park was swarmed with hippies. We'd never seen something like that before. <laughs> and... and I was heading, I was on my way to Vietnam and I thought, boy, did I make a bad decision in my life. Wow. <laughs> yeah, so, so I, got to, I got to see the setup for the BN, but I wasn't there for the actual BN, you know? Damn. And here we are 52 years later in 2018. And do you know what else happened on this day in history? This is the day that Elvis Presley was promoted to sergeant in the army. <laughs> I, I keep up with all these big events. In the, in the, in the 50s. Yeah. No, in the 60s. He was in Nam, right? No, no. He, no, that, that, he went to Germany, I think. He went to Germany. Yeah. So, uh, Amara's taking a picture of you on the phone. <laughs> and uh, just to complete the circuit here, uh, yeah. John came with Tom DeFonte, who's downstairs right now. And he was one of the founders of a group called Seagraph, Special Interest Group oh, Graphics. Sure, Seagraph, yeah. Yeah, they were the founders Huge. of Seagraph is here. So wow. that's all about uh, graphics and animation and that whole field that uh, how it evolved. And he's one of the guys that started it all. And John's here because they're they're seeding this idea of, of community clouds, community clouds, computer networks that don't belong to Amazon, don't belong to uh, Apple, but they belong to uh, uh, the local community and the universities. Whoever seeds them, and that's a that's a big project that they're unfolding right now. They're like Johnny Appleseed going from campus to campus. Uh, what, what? Yeah, he says they're bigger than Google now because of the community cloud is catching on. Yeah, if 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 you guys would send me some information about that, John, I, I can publicize it here in the in the podcast some because we have a lot of university students listening in if you're trying to promote it that way. Well, we've but, got plenty of customers. Uh, basically, uh, we, we allow anyone to attach their hardware to our cluster if they want to share it. So it's stone soup. So, so send me uh, somebody send me a link on that so I can uh, I'd like to I'd like to get involved myself. But you know the the thing about you guys in Santa Cruz is anybody in any apartment in Santa Cruz can open the door and say, "Hey, come on in, let's talk," and you guys would have a fantastic conversation. That city is full of people like you guys. It, How did that happen? I have a I have a, uh, a little uh, a little jingle for the for John's cloud that he's telling you about. Yeah, it's very familiar to people. Hey, you. Jump onto our cloud. <laughs> <laughs> I think you, can, you might have some patenting or uh, copyright issues. <laughs> Anything could be licensed. <laughs> it's also fair use. <laughs> it, you know, you guys in Santa Cruz are making, the rest of us are all sitting alone in our apartments, and you guys are having this damn party and making us all look really bad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're teaching by example. We're seeding the yeah. cloud, man. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, Michael, has some Michael has a comment. Yeah, so well, we're teaching by example here. <laughs> and we got a nice salmon dinner that son's about to go cook for us yeah, all. Yeah, well, you know, yeah. speaking of teaching by example, we have this new form of democratic leadership called leading by example. So instead of going to a protest rally, instead, you just invite all your friends to get together and lead by example and do whatever the fuck they think is the thing to do for exercising your freedoms. <laughs> I, I think you just sold a whole bunch of people on that idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've been working on it. We've been scheming for at least two parties now. <laughs> yeah, I, I, can, I can tell a lot of thought has gone into all that. 
so yes yeah, so, uh, uh, yeah, so just to give you the, the a nickel tour here this is the upstairs room this is where everyone is hanging out there we go my son over there well, and, well uh, i i have i have to say al that you know, I, I had told everybody that Bruce Damer would be here and they, you know, heard Bruce dozens of times here in the salon and on his own podcast and, and <laughs> people are all wired party. to talk to Bruce about artistic life and, and yeah, then we're going to party. Yeah, that's right. This is the downstairs <laughs> party. This is Tom talking about the Abbey. So we're, so we're drinking the local Lahonda <laughs> wines. They are uh, <laughs> delicious. And I try to be a local holler whenever possible. Yeah. <laughs> it's my, it's my well, like the also has to charge for advertising now, so just remember. <laughs> uh, well, Honda, yeah. Real Honda. Is, is, yeah, this is supposed to be a commercial free podcast, you know. <laughs> yeah, commercial free. Well, I guess, you know, if we uh, could pass some samples out, that would be good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like smell over here. I have a guest here. Mihai was trained at MIT in uh, nuclear deterrence. <laughs> you know, <coughs> you know, you guys are actually just having way too much fun for the rest of us. And <laughs> yeah, I'm going to bring you back to Bruce here. Hold on. <laughs> we need to let Bruce sign off here because we're coming up to to. Okay, here we go. We're coming up to my witching hour because I'm I'm. I fall asleep early nowadays, you guys. You got it. Okay, I, I, I couldn't hang with you guys anymore. <laughs> okay, well, thanks for uh, for making our evening so exciting, yeah. Lorenzo and and company. <laughs> and here's Bruce. Hey, Bruce. It's been a joy, Bruce. It's been a joy talking with you. I know everybody's been counting on seeing you and talking with you tonight, and it's been great. I hope that you can stop by again some night. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, d definitely more regularly. This is a this is great, a great social dip into the Sci Salon Saloners world. And and you know this is this is sort of kind of how it goes every every Monday. We've been doing it for almost a year now, and uh, you know we've have have people. One of, one of my favorite ones was the night a guy came in from Slovenia, and and the next day I actually had to go look it up because I I only vaguely knew where it was. Here's a country of two million people, and he had just hosted a psychedelic conference that had over 300 people at it <laughs> in Slovenia. And, uh, you know, it's amazing how throughout the world, uh, you know, we've got, uh, I don't see, if, oh, there's Travis. Travis is here from New Zealand. Somebody else is here from New Zealand, Saskatchewan, Montreal. Uh, we've, we've had people from all over the world show up, and I'm just going to do this every Monday night for as long as I can from now on out. So. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Bruce, I'm I'm putting you and Al on this uh, automatic invite. You don't have to feel obligated, but any Monday night you want to pop in here, we would love to have you. Okay, great. Yeah, and and I have to I have to just say it's been a added treat to see Amara again. I'm, Amara, I send you my love. I I can't do enough for all the work that you've done, all the articles you've written. I've read a lot of them. It's so good to reconnect with you, Lorenzo. Oh, uh, I, I appreciate everything you've done, Amara. It's, uh, you know, not, this wouldn't happen tonight if it hadn't been for that article you wrote. You know, I, I never had heard of DMT or Terrence McKenna before then. So, uh, so we have changed, <laughs> changed the reality structure of the universe. I know. I, I took a drug the other day and I came up and there was a guy in the White House that I couldn't recognize. I couldn't believe it. I, I'd never have come down, I guess. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Listen, everybody, I, I thank you all for being here tonight. I, uh, I wish you all well, and everybody keep the old faith and stay high. All right. <laughs> all right. All right. All right. Thanks, Lorenzo. Night, all. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.